Welcome to Work 22, a two day virtual symposium to help leaders anticipate the challenges they'll be facing in the next normal. We're focusing on 2022 as post pandemic year one with all that that entails. I'm Abby Lundberg, editor in chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be moderating the event along with my colleague, executive editor Elizabeth Heichler. Today and tomorrow, we'll host a series of 30 minute presentations and fireside chats featuring new research and insights from the world's top thinkers on the future of work. Our speakers are academic researchers and senior executives, all chosen because of their unique and compelling perspectives, insights, and experiences. To kick off this morning, Aruna Ravichandran, Chief Marketing Officer of WebEx by Cisco, will share her vision of hybrid work as the future of work. Aruna is a change agent with a track record of guiding customers, partners, and global teams through workforce and technology transformations. Welcome, Aruna. Thank you so much. I'm Aruna Ravichandran. I'm the CMO for WebEx by Cisco, and extremely honored and excited to join you guys all today. And it's a great to have you all here today. And it's such an awesome pleasure for WebEx by Cisco to actually sponsor the Work 22 event. The opportunity is unevenly distributed, but human potential is not. And what we have seen is that technology can be a huge enabler for the 3 billion digital workers around the world. There are 1 billion knowledge workers and 2 billion field as well as frontline workers. And with technology, it can become a big enabler in terms of being able to level the playing field. Uh, technology can play a huge role in terms of being able to remove the barriers of geography, language, personality type, and social economic levels. And companies around the world are actually contemplating how to best return to the office. But office is not just the office. Uh, right? And so everyone is wondering about what does the future of work actually look like? And what we have actually seen is that future of work is going to be hybrid. It's not just about working from the office. Future of work is going to be about working from home, working from the office, and working somewhere, anywhere in between. But it's not just about where you work. It's actually about the work you actually do. And what will it take to create company cultures that will unlock the human potential? Whether employees are going to be able to work from home, the office, or anywhere in between. So we uh, at Cisco recently launched this uh, uh, hybrid index study, and we examined people's habits and technology interactions and how that has permanently actually shaped the work a year and a half into the COVID pandemic. Findings showed that hybrid workers expect greater flexibility, accessibility, and security while businesses are trying to meet with increased technology demands. We, there were some important interesting learnings which we actually learned. We learned that people want a choice. 64% of all employees around the world want the ability to have the ability to work remotely. And that, in fact, actually directly impacted whether they're going to stay in their job or actually leave a job in order to basically find the flexible opportunity to work from anywhere. Another thing we learned is that inclusivity is going to become even more important. And inclusivity is not just about diversity or accessibility. It's more and more than that. It's about breaking down the barriers across culture, social economic level, um, uh, location, diversity, et cetera, et cetera. And another interesting learning was that in most meetings, only 48% of participants actually express themselves. That was staggering, which means that a lot of people are, don't really express themselves during a conference call. And last but not the least, everyone needs to have an equal seat at the table, which means that uh, in the future, 98% of meetings will at least have one person who's going to be joining that particular meeting remotely. So why is this important? It means that work from home, work from the office, and work from anywhere in between, which is the future of work, 
is going to be hybrid. And every, regardless of where you work, whether home, office, or anywhere in between, everyone needs to have an equal seat at the table. We found that there are five important ingredients which are extremely essential when you think about the future of work, especially when you think about this hybrid work. The five important essential ingredients for hybrid work are the hybrid work has to be inclusive, has to be flexible, needs to be supportive, secure, and last but not the least, managed. Let's dig into each and every one of them. First, inclusivity is about being able to provide an equal seat at the table for everyone, regardless of the fact whether they're working from home, office, or anywhere in between. You wanna make sure that nobody feels that they are second class citizens. And this is where technology has played a tremendous role in terms of being able to level the playing field. Examples of technology like background noise removal. So you could be working from home in your kitchen and you could have you know, somebody in the background, whether they're actually speaking in the background, you could have your dogs barking in the background, or you, you could, could even have the annoying lawn mower in, uh, you know, someone actually moving your lawn outside, which could potentially disrupt your uh, existing work. But with technology, now we have the ability to completely mask whether it is noise or voice in the background so that you have the ability to continue to basically provide professional uh, delivery during your meetings. How cool is that? Imagine working in a coffee shop where it tends to be extremely noisy and it doesn't matter whether you're working in a coffee shop, you're working in a loud game event. And with technology, now you have the ability to continue to work flawlessly. The second important element where I've seen technology play another big role is breaking down the barriers of across location and culture is uh, with technology, you have the ability to continue to speak the language of your choice. And you now have the ability to translate in real time into multiple different languages. Imagine how awesome it would be that I could be speaking in English and somebody located in Poland or somebody located in any part of the geography, they want to basically uh, listen to what I'm actually speaking during the particular call and translate that into language of their choice. And you have the ability to now do that in real time. There are other important technology like uh, giving an equal seat at the table, a voice for those introverts with emojis and gestures. As you think about it, being able to create those inclusive experiences is much more important. And this is where technology can play a tremendous role in terms of level the playing field. Other important ingredients are flexibility. This is about being able to adopt to a range of different type of work styles, different type of roles and environments that people are going to operate in. And the system is going to need to be smart enough and sophisticated enough to accommodate all of these environments and various different use cases. The future of work needs to be supportive. And this is about the whole notion of making sure that we can ex uh, extend what we can ex actually extend to our employees as well as our coworkers. At Cisco, we actually believe that empathy is a superpower and that well being is the other side or the coin to productivity. In fact, it is impossible to have sustained productivity if you actually ignore em employee well being. And this is where technology can also play an important role. You have the ability to really focus in and hone in on employee well being with various different techniques understand the pattern of behavior because our work life as well as our personal life has actually blended right now. And how do you basically take care of your coworkers, your employees' mental health? How do you basically ensure that the patterns do not cause a, a disruption in terms of their mental health across the board? And there are many, many ways where you as an employer, as a coworker can lead with empathy. Another important element is about security. Security cannot be an afterthought. It has to be a forethought. Security cannot be bolted on. It has to be built in. And you have to be secure by design and private by default. And last but not the least, hybrid work needs to be managed. This is about the unsung heroes of the past year and currently, plus those IT professionals that have allowed companies to keep their businesses running. And with hybrid work, 
comes new set of admin requirements for IT. So they need to provide exceptional management that removes all kind of friction within the process. If a company actually adopts all of those five different important essential ingredients, then the success is going to be automatic. It in turn leads to more energized and happy employees, leads to better productivity, huge retention in terms of being able to retain your existing employees and also gives you access to a global workforce. And last but not the least, as a huge will have a huge impact in terms of both the company's top line as well as bottom line. Thank you so much for joining us at this event today, Work 22. We at WebEx Business Co are very, very honored to be an official sponsor for this Work 22 event. There are some going to be amazing speakers during the course of this two day event. Please tune in, stay down and relax and enjoy the show. Thank you for joining us today. Aruna, thank you so very much. So Elizabeth Heichler, Sloan Management Review's executive editor will introduce our next speaker. Welcome Elizabeth. Thanks Abby. Our next session will focus on the new challenges of leading in an era of employee activism. Megan Rates is professor of leadership and dialogue at Holt International Business School in the UK. Her research explores the intersection of leadership, change, dialogue, and mindfulness. She's listed on both the Thinkers 50 radar and HR Magazine's list of most influential thinkers. Megan has authored several books. Her latest is Speak Up. Welcome, Megan. It's a good afternoon from the UK. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining me here. Now, for the last eight years, uh, my research colleague, John Higgins, and I have been exploring speaking truth to power in organizations. In other words, we've been exploring what gets said and what doesn't, and who gets heard and who doesn't inside our organizational systems. And over the last couple of years, we've seen a really, really interesting pattern that I'm going to talk with you uh, about today, and that's employee activism. Voices of difference inside organizations seeking to influence the organization's policy and actions on wider social and environmental issues. And one of the very many reasons why this is very interesting is it's upsetting power dynamics inside our organizations. I mean, to generalize, and it is a generalize, generalization, leaders have traditionally been used to being, you know, in control, knowing the answer, directing other people what to do in their particular business focused area. And with employee activism, suddenly, leaders are finding themselves not so in control actually not knowing the answer because there isn't one, not being able to kind of direct and having to work with and in a wider remit than just the traditional business space. So what I'm gonna do, I've only got 15 minutes with you, but I'm gonna cover some of my key research points. I've just picked out a few and I'm gonna end with some pragmatic, I hope, advice for leaders and organizations uh, in the area of employee activism. Here's the first point. So a question to you, actually, when I say the word activism, what comes to mind? What images, what thoughts, what emotions, what judgments? So we've asked thousands of people that question, and it's fascinating. One thing's clear, activism, is a loaded, controversial term. And in some places in the world around some issues, it's really quite cool to be labeled an activist. In other areas of the world around other issues, being labeled as an activist is life-threatening. And activism to some, kind of conjures up thoughts of change and courage and passion. And to others, actually, it conjures up protest, even violence. So activism means different things to different people and depends on your perspective. 
So Ruchika Tulshian, who I've spoken to about activism, she's author of The Diversity Advantage and does a lot of work with both gender and racial equity. Uh, she said to me, you know, what looks like rebellion to you, if you're up there in the executive suite, might be another person's fundamental human rights. So I might look down in the organization and think, gosh, they're causing some trouble. And actually, when you see the world from that perspective, no, 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 it's nothing like that. It's a matter of survival. It's a matter of human rights. Now, this matters because you as a leader will take decisions and make choices on how you respond, driven in part by your assumptions. So you've got to make those assumptions clear and start talking about them. Second point for today, uh, in our research on speaking truth to power, we had a, a really interesting research finding, and that is that as you get more senior, you become more optimistic. If I'm being really controversial and provocative, I say deluded at that point you become optimistic that others are speaking up around you when they aren't. So what we find in our data is that as you get more senior, you overestimate the degree to which people speak up. You overestimate your listening skills. You overestimate your approachability. Now, what that means is that it's very easy, perhaps even inevitable, that you end up in what I call an, an optimism bubble. And you're unaware of some of the challenges and some of the feelings that your employees have. So that's a major issue with activism. And that's how activism really takes leaders by surprise. It's because they've been in this kind of optimism bubble. A third point here is, you know, in the past, and a not too distant past either, leaders and organizations have sometimes sought to say, well, you know, we're neutral on this. We are apolitical. And they've kind of sat on an activism fence. And what we're discovering is that that explanation or excuse is getting pretty difficult to say now because inaction, of course, is as political as action. Yeah? If we don't take a stand, if we don't act, that also affects the social and environmental systems that we're in. So to kind of say, well, I'm apolitical and neutral doesn't really make sense anymore. So one of our warnings to leaders would be, think very carefully before you use that choice of, of words. Now, that's not to say that you now have to act on every single issue that's out there. That's not the point. You have to make choices. That's the point. And you have to notice that where you don't act is also kind of as relevant as where you do act, has implications. Uh, and I also wanted to cover with you, we, we, we looked at leader and organizational responses to employee activism, and we created a kind of taxonomy, if you like, a spectrum of responses that we, we've tended to see. And it's everything from, we've got non-existent down there. I spoke to a chief executive fairly recently, and I brought up issues of, of activist issues, wider environmental social concerns, and I have to say, he looked utterly baffled. <laughs> it would appear that these issues just haven't got onto the agenda at all. So there's a few cases, less and less, but there's a few situations where it just seems non-existent. Then another response, of course, is suppression, either on purpose suppressing voices or kind of by accident suppressing voices. Then there's what I call facadism. Now, this is, uh, this is quite a hot topic at the moment, particularly with the COP26 um, uh, climate change conference that we've had here in the, in the UK. 
Um, and that's when leaders say really good stuff. As Greta Thunberg called it, the blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they've got all the right words, but no action. It's a facade. There's nothing actually happening underneath. Then we get to engagement, but first of all, we get to what we call defensive engagement. And this is where leaders do engage with activists and their issues, but only the bare minimum. It's just what they really, really feel they have to. It's a bit sort of begrudging. After that comes a, a step change and we enter what we call dialogic engagement, which is when leaders realize that they they don't really know the answer on this. And they tend to start really listening and sharing information and sharing decision making around particular issues. And finally, of course, we've got some organizations that are activist organizations. They are stimulating activism. They recruit activists and promote activists. You know, the Patagonias and the Ben and Jerry's of the world. So there's a kind of spectrum of, of different responses. And one really interesting thing here, uh, bringing together some of the points I've just been making about um, the optimism bubble uh, and, and this, this, this kind of spectrum of, of your perspective on activism depends on where you are in an organization. Look at, look at this data. This is data from about 2000 uh, as a portion of our data that we've been looking at from about 2000 employees uh, across the hierarchy, across the globe, across different industry sectors. And we asked them, well, how would you describe your organizational response to employee activism? And you'll see the categories that I've just been uh, explaining along the bottom there. And here's the interesting thing. Guess what? The more senior you become, the more likely you are to say, we're in dialogue, yeah, we're engaging. As you go down the hierarchy, you're more likely to say, call that dialogue. <laughs> I don't call that dialogue. And this is another really interesting factor again about activism, what seems like dialogue and engagement up here isn't necessarily being experienced at that as that over here. Now, why do individual leaders react and respond the way that they do? We've done a ton of work on that. I, I don't have very much time to go through it, but just to give you an indication of what's there. Um, they make their response according to a number of factors, and, and these are quite strong in this. We've, uh, we've got a mnemonic this which is act if okay so a stands for authority so one way they make their choices around response is the degree of power and authority that they feel that they have in a particular situation in comparison uh, to other stakeholders c stands for concern so obviously they make their choices in response depending on how they feel their stakeholders care about a particular issue and whether they even know whether their stakeholders here, in this case, employees care about a particular issue. They make their choices according to what we call the theory of change. And that relates to many things, but in particular, do they regard their organization as a kind of standalone independent entity? you know, that they can kind of draw boundaries? Or do they regard their organization very much as participating in, inevitably, wider social and environmental issues and affecting, affected by them and affecting them? So that's kind of the world view, that theory of change. Identity affects the way uh, leaders respond? Do they see themselves as activists? Do they see their organization as an activist organization? Do they, as we've phrased it, think of themselves as rule makers or rule takers? Identity is a big issue. And then the field, the, what's happening in the field, what's happening out there in the world right now? 
you know, when the, after George Floyd was killed, there was an immense amount of action then in relation to Black Lives Matter. In the UK and, and wider afield, COP26 has created quite a lot of responses and reactions in relation to climate change. So what is going on at the moment obviously also impacts how leaders respond. Now, I'm going to leave you with um, some ideas around, well, what does it mean to be proactive in terms of employee activism? If you're a leader that wants to kind of engage with this, what do you need to do? And I kind of look at this in, in three categories, looking at inquiring, facilitating difference, and then acting. So with inquiry, that first point that I made in this talk, you know, noticing, well, what does activism mean to me? What assumptions and judgments do I have about this particular topic or these particular people? You know, really surfacing that is very important. You can't inquire and listen well unless you've looked at that first. Then we talk about sharpening your antennae. You know, really, do you know what matters? to your stakeholders? How? Are you sure? What are the methods by which you can really stay connected and tuned in? And then we look at cultivating a, a climate of, of line manager listening. Now it's interesting, employees obviously care about what their organization says at the top level and the statements, but actually, employees form an opinion about whether their organization cares about them and listens to them through their relationship with their line manager. That relationship is really important. So how do we work with line managers and their ability to engage in topics that they might not be used to uh, engaging with? In terms of facilitating difference, we talk about uh, the ability to mediate difference being kind of as comfortable as possible with holding different views and different opinions and encouraging respect of that. And there's all sorts of things behind that, including role modeling it at a senior level and making difference okay. Um, it means sharing information and also decision-making. So with many of these issues, yet yeah, leaders are not in the best position to know what to do. So how do you work with the employee resource groups, for example, and sharing your information and, and asking them to share their information and collectively understanding what are the best choices to make? And then, of course, be prepared to, for fallout because, you know, we're talking about issues where people very often will always disagree. So how do you, how do you deal with mistakes how do you deal with the fact that you can't resolve some of these issues? How do you learn as a leader and an, as an organization to work with difference better and better? By the way, we call kind of, you know, the ability to facilitate and be with difference. Um, it's like the canary in the coal mine. So employee activism is a bit like the canary in the coal mine in that it, it if you can't tolerate difference there, it may signal that you can't tolerate difference in things like innovation. And finally, act. I've already mentioned, you know, probably wise not to say that you're apolitical. You have to make choices to so make them thoughtfully. Um, include activism in your strategic plan. So discuss as a group how it's going to feature in your strategy going forward. And then, of course, you know, watch what you're saying and match it with actions and track that robustly. If you don't track it, you can rest assured that your employees will. I'll leave you with just a couple of resources to find out more. And then I will uh, hand back to Elizabeth and I and hope maybe that we might have some some questions there. Thank you so much, Megan. That's uh, fascinating. and. Um, such a current issue. I see, you know, just the other day, there was a, we saw Apple in the news again for some difficulties with how it was handling one of its employee activists. And we've got, of course, some really great questions coming in from the audience, happy to say. Um, 
One, uh, maybe just, just to, uh, to begin with, um, you've told us, I'm interested in the other side of the coin, you've told us what makes for good leadership around activism. Do you have any guidelines for activist employees in terms of how to be effective and what to avoid? Yes. So we've interviewed many, many activists as well, and that's, uh, yeah, it's good to get a chance to talk to that side of things. So one of the top things that activists talk to us about when we ask them what, what's effective, what works, top code in our research was listening. And I thought that was really interesting. It, it wasn't advocating or causing, a, you know, causing a, a, an impact. It was listening and curiosity. So that's a big factor. Uh, another factor for activists is linking in uh, to support systems. It is incredibly wearing to be the lone voice that is chipping away at the majority view, yeah? And in fact, one of the traps for activists that we found was burnout. You know, many, many uh, activists experiencing burnout. So how they link in with others is really important. And the final thing, um, I use a, an, an academic term by a couple of academics, uh, Mayerson and Scully. They, they use a term called tempered radical. Okay, and I think this is really interesting. Um, when you're an activist, you're radical. Okay, you're, you're wanting to change the system. But if you're too radical, that system will eject you and you won't be, you won't be making any change. So how do you temper what you do so that the system can hear and change. But how do you make sure that you don't temper it so much that it makes no change at all? And so I think that, you know, navigating that is at the heart of, of effective activism and it's, and it's tricky. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, let's see, a uh, question from our audience here. Have you found a correlation between employee activism and either a strong culture of innovation and or a strong sense of of uh, psychological safety. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, I wouldn't, you know, I'm very, I'm very wary with my use of the word correlation. It gives me the shivers as a researcher. Um, <laughs> what I will, what I will say is that these, these are, are really entwined uh, areas. So um, you can get an organ in terms of speaking up and psychological safety. Yes, I think that we've, we've been exploring how willing and able are people to speak up about all sorts of issues and what do they think will be the consequences of that. Right. And that's, you know, at the heart of psychological safety and some of Amy Edmondson's work as well. And um, uh, so activism is certainly related to that. When you're in a, a psychologically safe environment, you are likely to feel more able to speak up. However, it's not a direct pattern you know it might feel very safe to speak up with ideas that i have to do about the business mm -hmm. but it might feel very dangerous indeed to speak up about racial discrimination so it's it's kind of tricky to to, to put them together innovation i think is a really interesting one as i mentioned at the end um you know one way of thinking about activist voices is that they can be you know if there are no activist voices you need to just check out, does that mean that there isn't an ability to tolerate difference in the organization? And if there isn't that, then you, I am pretty sure that that is going to affect your ability to innovate and think and challenge perspectives inside your organization. And that's gonna to lead to trouble pretty quickly. Right, absolutely. I can see the, see the relationship there. Um, another audience question, how are leaders to respond to employee activism positions that are not congruent with organizational values and objectives? Yeah, yeah and, and do, you know, do you know what? Some of them won't be. So again, some of, these, some, some of the issues that we look at in activism are a bit more, there's a bit more consensus around them than other issues. Um, uh, one thing I think is really, really important here is how do you engage with the issue? Where we've seen organizations and leaders fall flat is that they basically said, no, because we stand for this. And they haven't leant forward. They have not shown that kind of, hang on, curiosity, 
Mm -hmm. Let me just understand a bit more about what's going on. Okay, now I understand your perspective. Look at where we're coming from. Here's the information that you may not have seen about what we're doing. Look at where we are. And then you need to make choices, yeah? And sometimes you will leave people disagreeing with you, but at least there'll have been kind of some humanity, some relationship in that process. So it's it's the kind of how you make the choices that you do that I think is a really important um, thing to, to look at there. Right, okay. Um, uh, somebody asked whether employee research, uh, I'm sorry, employee resource groups are impactful or, or can play a role in this area. Depends if the leaders are listening. Okay. <laughs> let me let me just say a little bit more about that. Um, so there are many really, really good ways for uh, organizations to hear different views and be challenged, different perspectives. Employee resource groups can work exceptionally well, like other things like reverse mentoring and shadow boards and all sorts of different ways to to really hear what matters to people. But all of that is stands on, do leaders really, really want to listen or is it a tick box exercise? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the difference. And I, I'm afraid to say, <laughs> I, I've probably worked with more organizations who do all of these things, but it's for the wrong reasons. And so it's, a, it's kind of a, philosophical fundamental question that's in front of leadership teams it's like you know what okay why are you doing this is it because you feel you should do or is there really do you are, are you interested are you curious with all the things that you don't know um, right so great so, question yeah well and unfortunately that it was the last question that we had time for we had a, but several more really good questions here that uh, that we'll share with you just so you can see what what this generated and and thank you so much uh, I want to also share with the audience that uh, Megan has a uh, an, an article coming out soon in uh, MIT Sloan Management Review that uh, really uh, delves into her playbook for em leadership playbook for employee activism so really excited about that too so thank you so much for being with us uh, Really Thank you very much. Today, Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. And uh, now I will turn things back over to Abby uh, for a conversation with our next speaker. So a lot of organizations have strengthened their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, but managers often aren't clear on what specific practices will make an impact. In our next session, Stephanie Creary, Assistant Professor of Management at Wharton and an Identity and Diversity Scholar, We'll share findings from a large scale research study that shows which practices really underlie positive DEI outcomes. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to be here with you all. Why don't we start with just tell us a little bit about your research, um, what were your intention and goals, and, and if you had to write a headline for your findings, what would it be? Yeah, so, so much I could possibly say about my research, but let me first start by talking about my research orientation, because I think it's really helpful for understanding why I ask uh, questions about diversity, equity, inclusion in the ways that I ask them. Uh, so for me, I, I, I subscribe to this area of scholarship called positive organizational scholarship. And so what that means is when I'm investigating questions related to diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm really trying to understand DEI through the lens of there being potential for good, for being potential for development, and for there being potential for trust. Um, and so the key word there is potential, right? It's this idea that in organizations, there's so many factors that might get in the way for, uh, from us realizing these, these subscribed benefits of DEI. And I think we've experienced many of these. Uh, sometimes it's your relationship with your direct manager, your teammates, and sometimes it's something more contextual, like the climate of the organization in which you work or the pandemic. So all of these factors can, can be challenging, but also at the same respect, a lot of these can actually, uh, in different ways, if leveraged effectively, can be uh, helpful to DEI. So that said, um, what I'm fundamentally interested in answering is this idea of how do we take um, the issues and challenges that we know exists around diversity, equity, inclusion, again, that these issues may be related to people, they may be related to the system and the structures. How do we actually improve those so that more of us can uh, 
realize these positive outcomes from DEI, um, such as being able to feel that we're known and understood um, for who we are, so sense of identity validation, uh, that we feel like we are developing positive and allied relationships with people who work with us. Um, if we think about as a, as a manager, I feel like I'm a, being an effective manager in leading DEI in my team. And then for organizations broadly, is that we are actually being able to coordinate and collaborate better um, as, a, as a function of uh, the practices, processes we've put in place. So those are the questions, big questions that I answered. I'm fundamentally interested in making and uh, helping us all to understand scientifically, how do we improve? We have decades of research saying how fraught uh, diversity, equity, inclusion can be, and, I mean, all the reasons why it doesn't work, but I'm, I'm committed, as are other scholars, to really focusing on, what, well, how do we change that? So what should business and DEI leaders do better, do, do to better engage middle managers who are pretty busy already, just getting the daily work of the organization done? What, what, what needs to change? To put this in the context of, of, of my research, uh, recently in May of 2021, my colleagues at Wharton and I released a public facing report of a larger, broader academic study. I um, mean, the public facing report is, is, is called Improving Workplace Culture Through Evidence Based Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Practices. And that's available, it's easily searchable, but it's also available on the Wharton Diversity website. Um, so there were two motivations for doing this research. Uh, Certainly, it is a, is a project that is fundamentally decided to, designed to first um, contribute to science, but also to contribute to practice. That wasn't necessarily the motivation. That's just the philosophy of how I do research and certainly how many of my colleagues at Wharton do research as well. But one of the primary motivations is firmly rooted in a longstanding opportunity in the field of diversity, equity, inclusion, both in, in uh, theory, in science, but also in practice. And that is, as I talked about my own research agenda, we know what's wrong, right? Organizations know what's wrong. They, they can look at their data and they can see who's thriving and who's not. They can see who's turning over and who's not. What we lack is our specific evidence-based insights into if we do X, then we are more likely to change that pattern. And so when we talk about evidence-based diversity, equity, inclusion practices, we're using similar language that they use in the field of medicine, is if you have medicine sitting in a medicine cabinet, you don't just take it randomly for any problem that you have, you pick medicine that's designed to address the specific needs that you have. So the first motivation for this study was to begin to think about which medicines, called DEI practices, do we need to take when we have this particular issue in our organization? So mapping DEI practices onto outcomes. The second was very much in the spirit of the question you asked and what the prior speaker talked about was middle manager engagement. So over the 15 years that I've been doing both applied and, and academic research on this topic, you know, I've heard so many dehumanizing ways of framing uh, the lack of middle manager engagement from middle managers being the roadblock and the obstacles. And, and honestly, if I were a middle manager and I saw that language, I wouldn't want to be supportive of anything either. So for me, it was, let's think about middle managers as people, as humans who have a lot of work to do, much like all of us, but perhaps if middle managers are not as showing demonstrated commitment to DEI work, perhaps the question, the issue is, is we're not meeting them where they are. And so the other part of this research was, how do we begin to um, translate um, all of the opportunities into middle manager language? What are the specific mm -hmm. tactics that they need to uh, become familiar with and certainly that we need to help them, um, the operative word there is help them, help them become more um, comfortable with and competent around so that they can create team cultures that are uh, inclusive and where people feel like they belong. So those were the motivations of the studies and I, I can definitely um, say lots of different reasons why uh, this gap exists. I'll just give you two of them. Uh, one of them is because um, many organizations spend a lot of time um, trying to engage senior managers, right? That th there's a lot that needs to be done to take an organization that doesn't have um, a viable diversity, equity, inclusion strategy to move them from not having one to something that is actually viable for the future. And while a lot of energy gets placed there, as it should, 
um, we see sometimes um, DEI leaders and, and people leaders think that the same strategies are going to work with middle managers, and they don't because middle managers aren't engaged by market position and competition. They are engaged by telling them how this is going to change their team and their yeah. performance and team affect. So, so framing differently becomes important. And then, secondly, again, we we underestimate the power of helping people to understand that DEI work is just as important as their other work, but yeah. sending the signal that it's what I call a side hustle is not good. So when it looks like you can just stop doing it and there's no, um, no one's gonna say anything, then you're feeding this idea that it's not important. Um, so I'll just start there, but those are some of the things that I, I would say resonated with me as I listened to the other speaker um, talk, but certainly as I think about what our research says. Terrific. Now, you've identified, you, you talked at the beginning about the, um, you know, overlaying the practices on the outcomes that you're trying to get, and you've identified seven categories of practices that can lead to those outcomes. Uh, is it important that companies tackle all seven? Uh, do some of them have a greater impact than others, or, or is there a best place to start? So, so, because I am also a professor, I feel the need to actually tell people what the well, seven, they are. Yeah, <laughs> is to say what the seven are. And then what I'm going to say is the report is very extensive and it will tell you there's a nice table that goes through these again. Um, and also tells you uh, in much more extensive form what I'm about to paraphrase. So here are the seven practices for anybody taking notes. The 1st are diversity recruiting initiatives, and that's the work that organizations do to bring in people who are historically underrepresented from various different sources um, into the organization. Then there's education and training, things like diversity training, unconscious bias training, having speaker series. The third is internal diversity partners. Now, so this is anybody who doesn't have a formal diversity title um, who does diversity work. Um, and, and typically um, in our study, we capture this as people who belong to employee resource groups, but also people who belong to internal diversity councils, for example. Managerial involvement. This is about the extent to which your direct supervisor is actively engaged in talking about DEI and doing DEI work with the team. So that was number four. Number five is mentoring and sponsorship. And we ask questions differently about mentoring versus sponsorship since we know these get at different behaviors. Mentoring being um, uh, the sense of giving people career advice and psychosocial support. And sponsorship tends to pick up advocacy um, it, it, a bit more than mentorship often does. Physical visibility is practice number six. This is the extent to which you see a variety of people, including people who look like you, if you're underrepresented, being acknowledged for their accomplishments. So we're celebrating a lot of different people, not just the same people. And also speaks to this idea of um, who's being pictured um, in, in different various company based outlets. Uh, and then the, uh, bucket number seven are workplace policies. And these are things like flexible work arrangements, working from home, um, anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, a lot of different policies that are uh, designed to help improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. So those are the seven. So now back to what you were asking, which was, as we start thinking about these seven categories of practices, should we just like be focusing on one? Should we doing, be doing all seven? And so what we did in our study was we looked at these seven practices and we mapped them onto about 12 different outcomes. And we tried to see where there are certain bundles of these practices that were more influential in, in driving that outcome, such as belonging rather than others. So let me give you an example, right? So for belonging, as let's just say belonging is the thing that you want to improve in your organization. And by the way, what I'm about to tell you um, is is um, you should think about this as what drives belonging for everyone. Because what we ended up finding in our study was that DEI practices help everyone, not just people who are underrepresented. So just keep that in mind as I tell you about the practices. It was really cool to find that. As I tell you about the practices that drive belonging. So three of those practices, um, when bundled together, um, form the strongest relationship to people's sense of belonging. And those are managerial involvement, so what your direct manager does, mentoring and sponsorship and workplace policies. Interestingly enough, those same three practices have some of the most um, strongest impact on so many of the outcomes. But that's not to say that the other four don't matter because there are outcomes such as speaking out against bias, speaking up to actively advocate uh, for people who don't look like you, being a champion, 
those outcomes, which we call voice outcomes or speaking up, are driven by other practices, such as internal diversity partners, ERGs, and, and having um, diversity councils, and knowing that that's something that's, uh, that's important and valued in your organization. Education and training. So diversity training gets so, so much of a bad rep in organizations because uh, oftentimes what it looks like is that's the only thing we're doing. Right. But when bundled with internal diversity partners, having ERGs, um, bundled with diversity recruiting and bundled with having a manager who's actually doing all this work, it does, it forms a part of the, 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 the it forms a part of the, the effect of diversity, equity, inclusion practices on people's sense of belonging. So, so the takeaway here is we're not talking about silver bullet, do one thing and everybody will be happy. We're talking about having to have a variety of medicines in the medicine cabinet. And sometimes, oftentimes you need more than one to help drive um, a stronger sense of improvement around that outcome. So, so that makes me wonder, um, in terms of how an organization would get to understanding what all those pieces are and then sort of putting the pieces in place and getting things going, what leadership models have you seen be most effective in terms of, of sort of driving that, uh, you know, whether it's learning from your research or, or other learnings, but to be able to then start to put all those pieces in place? Yeah, so the, the wonderful thing about this project, and again, I told you it took three years to collect the data to begin to say the things that I'm sharing with you all now, is that we very much involved experts um, from practice in this process, experts from diversity, from people, um, from the people team, from analytics, and, and a lot of the analytics people uh, aren't subject matter experts on diversity or people. They're, they're very good at stats and numbers and running models. And some of our earlier conversations in the first year were about how do we build this as a competency for firms? And so most firms are very early in their understanding of the need to do exactly what I'm suggesting is important to map practices on the outcomes to understand what's driving the outcome. Um, and so I feel confident based on the 30 plus people we engaged with the first year, follow, followed by the more than 50 people we continue to engage with year over year, that we are building a community of people and a support a system of community of people in organizations who are learning how to do this. Some organizations are already doing it on their own and they're already advanced. I think some tech firms and well, I know some tech firms and some financial service organizations, I think because of the nature of the work that they do, they're always looking at mapping drivers on outcomes, right? So, so many of them are already doing this work, but in other industries, I think we've been learning together and sharing together. Um, and so that's what it takes is, is uh, I think we leverage each other's respective expertise. Um, and then I think it's just this question of being open around answering questions together, uh, collaborations between academics and practice, which I think is what I'm learning is a very effective strategy. Well, um, I want to get to a couple of audience questions. The first one is um, how do potential mentees find a suitable mentor when when the senior leadership doesn't necessarily reflect their background? I'm not exactly sure, but uh, you can interpret what that question is asking there. Yeah, so there's actually a lot of academic research on this topic. So I'm, I'm happy to, and I've actually written um, a couple of, of thought pieces about this. Uh, so sometimes the assumption is that uh, for many of us is that um, I would be better mentored by someone who, who doesn't, someone who looks like me, right? So I identify as a black woman, an African-American woman. Um, I might believe that it would be great to have another black woman because she would, she would really get me. And so on some level, that, that's, that's great, right? So having a shared experience with somebody sometimes makes the conversation feel Ill, easy and comfortable. Well, the reality is, is that is not most people's situations if you're in an underrepresented group. So it becomes really important for you as somebody who is underrepresented to form mentoring and sponsorship relationships with people who, who are from other groups. That said, what we know from the research is that people who uh, are, are more likely to want to mentor or sponsor somebody who, who, who looks like them. And so a lot of the work that um, the research that I'm doing actually is a project that's looking at sponsorship and how do we enhance sponsorship or increase sponsorship of black and Latino uh, professionals is around how do we 
help people to understand how not to use the level of their comfort as a metric for who I'm going to mentor and sponsor and really put front and center the, the larger goals, which is this person's career or developing our organization. Because that's really what's at the heart of this is people are most comfortable with people who look like them, but that doesn't mean that that's actually the metric you should be using because it's the one that actually contributes to bias, right? Um, so it is, for, uh, I guess in summary, it is on the part of the person who's a ment who's the mentee to open themselves up to being mentored by a variety of people. But the person mentoring also needs to um, reciprocate and dive in deeply and and begin to uh, understand what they don't know, so they can be a more effective mentor for somebody who may not have their same same experience. You say that a lot of companies employ DEI practices that they think might work versus knowing what actually works. Um, can you give a, an example or two about um, you know what what those what those not yeah. working practices are and and then uh, well I'll, get, I'll do my follow up after you answer that one. Sure. So it's not that the DEI practices don't work. I, I do want to say that of those seven categories of practices and what those seven categories of practices represent are the sum total tonal uh, of internal facing DEI practices that we found across industry. Mm -hmm. So we didn't make these up. We said, what are you doing across industry? And they fell into seven buckets. Now that this, these seven categories of practices don't speak to external DEI work, such as community engagement. We didn't study that. We're just focusing on internal talent stuff. Okay, so there are seven categories of things that any firm can do. Where the mismatch is, is does that practice actually solve that problem? Yeah. So you might have business resource groups in, in, in place, but business resource groups don't necessarily always drive belonging. Even though it's common when you ask people why they have business resource groups in place, they say because we want to enhance belonging. But it's not a consistent driver across organizations. In some, it might. In some, it doesn't. And so how do we begin to understand what's driving people's experience of belonging in our organization is really the important question. Um, not here's a checklist of things we could possibly do. Let's do everything and hope for the best, which is sometimes what it looks like when we're not tailoring our practices to the things that are actually areas of opportunity for us. I, I imagine you've encountered organizations that are doing that mapping well. Like, how does, what does that look like? And I know you talked about all the sort of the different um, stakeholders who engage and are involved in this, but, but take us a little bit deeper into that part of it. Yeah, so um, I would say even the best organizations are still learning, right? So I don't, I, I don't wanna say that there's like one company out there that is actually doing exactly what I'm prescribing. If anything, we're trying to show a model that would help the people who are en route to doing more of this work to do more of this work. That said, with the people who are more advanced in this um, are understanding that you have to collect a variety of different types of data. Um, so I think one of the things that's the hardest piece about um, anything data related is, is how we collect data. And, and unfortunately, the most effective way of collecting data is, is surveying people. Um, and so as an employee, you might get so many requests for surveys and, and it just becomes so important to incentivize people to fill out surveys because what those surveys are doing is it's allowing us to begin to assess these relationships. So when I talk to companies who are trying to do this, one of the number one barriers is we can't collect the data and we can't collect the data because our organization has put a moratorium on the number of surveys we can send out. Um, we can only ask two questions, not 30. So having some rationale and I would say collaborative partnerships with all the people who decide how many surveys or if we can survey becomes the most important stepping stone to doing any of what I'm talking mm. to about. So data collection and data management is first and foremost the issues that most organizations are facing. And then once they have the data, they can begin to do some of the work that we've done to find these types of results. The next question has to do with, I, I think w for an organization that maybe is just sort of getting started with their DEI work, how, how do companies or managers introduce DEI activities in a way that avoids backlash? So it's interesting about this is I always, my students always ask this question. I teach diversity classes at Wharton, just started again back up last semester and 
I would tell you the first two weeks of class, people are asking the same question. Is there always thinking about the people who hate this topic <laughs> and how do we get them to change? So I'm going to give us a different paradigm um, and I'm going to give us a, a traffic light paradigm um, where we have green. We have green light, we have yellow light and we have red light. The green light, the green group is comprised of people who really love this topic, like the person who might have asked the question, right? You're a champion, you're an advocate, you really want to see change happen. Then you've got the yellow group, and the yellow group is a little bit more ambivalent about this topic because they see the upsides and the downsides. They might be concerned about people who hate this topic, but then they see the people who love this topic. Then you have the red uh, group, and, and fundamentally this question is about the red group, the people who don't like this topic, and how do you get people who don't like this topic to be engaged or to not be totally, um, uh, totally um, antagonistic to it. And so what I always tell people is this becomes fundamentally a question around change management. Take DEI out of it for a second. Let's talk about how do you engage people when you want them to think differently about something. Um, sometimes it is for the, what I found for the yellow group, the yellow group benefits from having access to data and information and having more explanation. Um, and so that's how I found that you can get more yellows to move into the lime green or the bright green category. For reds, it requires potentially some data, but even then sometimes reds reject the data. They might find fault with the methods or the sample size wasn't great enough. And so that's where uh, questions around accountability and um, telling people that it's a job requirement becomes really important. So that's not gonna change their minds or their hearts, but it does change their behaviors. So to answer the question a little bit more concretely, I think what people need to begin to understand is, is you can advance DEI um, if you have a sufficient amount, a number of people who are greens and yellow or greens and yellows doing the work. With respect to people who are in the red who don't like this topic, it becomes fundamentally focusing on different levers. And sometimes, depending on how important it is to the company, it does become a question of mandating that people do the work because as a function of us working in an organization, there are things that we must do um, in order to drive our organization forward and, and some things are non-negotiable. Great. Well, Stephanie, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, best of luck with your research. Thank you so much. Have a great day. So our next speaker will offer a different take on the future of work. Elizabeth, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Abby. Uh, in our next session, we'll be looking at what it takes to lead agile, high-functioning teams that collaborate effectively, something that's on a lot of people's minds as our teams are now more dispersed and working in such different uh, modalities. Rob Cross is the Edward A. Madden Professor of Global Leadership at Babson College. He has studied the underlying network dynamics of effective organizations and the collaborative practices of high performers for more than 20 years. He's co-founder and current research director of the Connected Commons, a consortium of over 100 organizations accelerating network research and practice. Thanks for being with us today, Rob. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's a real uh, treat to, uh, to be able to be here and to share some of the uh, insights and ideas that we've been uh, developing in the consortia. And um, what I wanted to do was take a, a slightly different track into looking at organizations and think about how uh, collaborations happen uh, in different places. So for what my, I've done and the work that I do with the consortium and colleagues at Babson has really been on this notion of looking at how collaborations happening inside organizations and then taking very concerted action, right? Based on what we see with the uh, analytic patterns that are out there. And this has become a, a bigger and bigger deal, you know, over especially the past say 10, 15 years, as so many efforts have targeted organizational structure to create agility, and they've generally been targeting the decision hierarchy, right? The things that kind of get in the way of speed to decision making. But as they've collapsed that hierarchy through spans and layers initiatives, agile initiatives, you know, matrix based design 10, 15 years ago, in tandem with all the collaborative applications that have come into the landscape that allow for more instantaneous access to each other. Um, what they have traded in some regard is a, is a different kind of challenge as the collaborative intensity of work has exploded and created um, all sorts of other inefficiencies to some degree in how work is happening. And so our work has really been geared to say, if you could see these patterns of interactivity, right, understand who's turning to whom for information uh, to get work done, it starts to open up different lenses on where you might exert effort in these more hyper-connected times uh, to get to uh, more agile ways of working. 
right out there. And so for us, there's different ways we can get the analytics. I don't want to get us bogged down into that with a short amount of time we have, but you compare kind of just a very, you know, small formal structure against an informal network where we're looking at who turns to whom for information to get work done. And obviously it's much more sophisticated. If we're looking at groups, usually we're in groups of at least 10, 15, 20,000 or larger uh, for large scale organizational changes or transitions to agile structure. Um, but if you just compare these as simple representations, what you start to see is, you know, universally uh, across all this work over the decades, is about three to five percent of the people tend to account for twenty to thirty-five percent uh, of the value-added collaborations, and you really today care about two people in that mix. One are the people that are dramatically overwhelmed. These shifts in how we're working have created pinch points around people that are slowing work down and affecting kind of their own ability to get work done and be innovative. And two is the fact that quite often the existing talent systems miss these people. So, of course, there's never one Mitchell when I'm looking at these groups. There's always, um, you know, if it's a group into the thousands, it can be hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of them. But what we tend to see is that when we compare my list of who the key collaborative enablers are in the organization against the company's list of who's in their top talent lists, there's only about a 50% overlap. Right, because we don't have metrics that are particularly good at seeing, in a lot of ways, the collaborative contribution of people. So, especially as we move into 2022 and the great resignations uh, predicted, you really care about both those people, right? Um, because they're the ones that are more likely to leave or not to want to come back to return to office uh, in certain ways. And you end up not just with that Mitchell walking out the door, the person, the human capital, but the way they're enabling others to, to get work done. So at one level, you care about that. At a second, we're very focused on understanding not just how do you get people engaged in an organization today, but how do you slingshot them into productive positions uh, in these networks? And typically what we've been able to see is it takes people about three to five years to come in and replicate the connectivity of a high performer doesn't mean they're not talking to people, right? It just means they haven't built the set of bridging relationships, reputational capital trust that distinguish those people that are enabled to innovate differently to drive scale in their work. And so a lot of what we've done in the consortia is to see, gosh, you know, there's about 10% of the population that manages to do this, not in three to five years, but in about nine to 12 months and really understanding, okay, how do we speed that agility? Right, and that ability to come into these groups and be more productive. And it's very counterintuitive. It's very different than conventional models that have been more based on looking at entry from a, a, a process of getting uh, into the structure in, uh, in certain ways. And then third, and of course, you know, you care about these peripheral people because you probably got about 18 months of them that haven't met. Uh, them, you know, their colleagues, right, in the same way as you've conventionally looked at. And so the consortium members are always focused on how do we feed in the kinds of connections? How do we use the analytics to see not just over the first 90 days, but over the first nine months? Here's the sets of connections that need to happen and, and facilitate that. And then lastly is where you start to see silos, you know, breakdowns in connectivity. And I'm never, ever coming back into groups and saying you want everybody connected to everybody else. If I asked how many people on this uh, video wanted another email meeting or phone call in their lives. There'd be no hands that shoot up unless typically they're the new person, right? Trying to, to figure out how things get done. But what we can see through these analytics are very targeted silos that are undermining the organization's ability to deliver scale, uh, to deliver innovation in different ways. And in particular, these are the connections that have been lost through the pandemic. Right, what we see from all the places that are mining this passively behind the scenes is that within group connections have gone up actually the intensity of that, but it's the cross group connectivity uh, that's that's fallen off. And so really thinking about, okay, how do we re-stimulate that, right? We may actually see greater productivity in the short term, but it's these bridging ties that have spurred innovation uh, that were falling off and we may not experience that impact for 18, uh, 24 months out there. So a set of very specific things, and I wanna drive very quickly uh, into what we see about more agile ways of working if you target uh, these mid-tier groups, groups in you know, eight to uh, you know, two, 300, 400, 500, where work is actually happening and we use this lens to see how you spur uh, their ability. But I wanna leave one idea out there, just building on the, the prior uh, speaker, that this is also a phenomenal lens to be looking at the effectiveness of DEI efforts, right? Not just um, static counts of people, but where are we getting true inclusion in these networks? And one of the biggest things that we uh, had happen was actually what to, to what the prior author was saying was getting access to data with the uh, George Floyd murder, 
right? Suddenly people were willing to give us access to ethnicity that we've never had before. And you start to see very different ways of promoting inclusion that I'm super hopeful about on many levels. So I'm going to leave that teaser out there. Maybe that's a piece of what we can talk about in the Q&A uh, element on this, but I just wanted to create a little bit of a tie to uh, what the prior author was talking about. If we look at these groups, right, if we go into organizations and say, gosh, it's less and less that we have teams that are stable enough that we can do vision, mission, purpose, assign roles and execute. And it's more the case today that the, the ability to execute at these critical points of delivery software development teams, new product development initiatives, uh, groups that, that are very rarely, you know, always small in size, always the two pizza team. Oftentimes I'd see them growing into the 60s, 80s, 100s, uh, if there were large engine platforms or things like that. Um, if we start to say, gosh, they're not really working as teams per se anymore, but more as networks that need to form together internally rapidly and then build connections externally rapidly, you start to see different opportunities uh, for improvement in these groups. You know, number one, what we know when we've done these analytics in all sorts of places and we're profiling the high performing units, right? The high performing teams or the retail outlets or where we have consistent groups of size. We know there are um, eight points in these networks that tend to predict the greater performers. One is what I've already mentioned. They tend to not have overload on the center and they tend to be aware of where their key talent is so that they're not susceptible to losing people. And this idea of overload has been a, a really big deal for me. And it's a huge deal in these digital transformations or the places that are going to talent marketplaces or moving really out of structures into say chapter designs or things like that is they have created in many ways a collaborative implosion uh, on people that uh, a larger and larger population are struggling with, right? We can see that uh, about 85% of most people's time pre-pandemic was spent uh, on the phone, on email, and other aspects of collaboration. That number's gone up five to eight hours through the pandemic for most people with uh, interactions drifting earlier into the morning and deeper into the night. And so we have a new pinch point, right? Before we had the hierarchy, now we have new kinds of pinch points that are happening in terms of how people can collaborate. Yet what we see in this work and a really heavy thrust with a consortium is that high performers today, those people that are producing the greater results, um, they tend to collaborate in ways that are about 18 to 24% more efficient than their peers. Right? So they're buying back about a day a week on the, the left side of this loop, and then they're investing it in ways that are enabling them to innovate differently. And so we've spent a huge amount of effort saying, okay, what are these people doing that are collaborating uniquely? They're not running more Zoom meetings, right? That's the thing that's, that's killed us is these shorter meetings and jamming more into an already busy day. They're collaborating in, in actually fundamentally different ways. Um, that is a model that we're starting to see built in to, to different ways of working. So you get the idea, right? We can actually see and understand where's this overload happening uh, in these networks and, and visibly slowing things down, driving attrition in totally different ways. And then you can start to target that. And so okay, this three, five, six percent of the population, we can do things that help shift those demands, help adapt the behaviors that are creating it. And we can do the same thing on the fringe, right? We know there's certain things that happen over the first nine months that dramatically speed people's entry into these more productive positions and networks, uh, decreases the likelihood that they leave, makes them more productive more quickly, and it's counterintuitive. It's not happening, for example, in the first 90 days. It's actually happening in very targeted ways over the first nine months. Uh, and, and some different behaviors about what these people are doing that uh, embed into the networks and get pulled in. Uh, third, we see silos um, and very specifically the points in these networks that are precluding scale efficiencies and, and undermining innovation. And when that, you see that, it starts to become a different activity to take the well-connected people on either side and say, how do we structure work just a little bit differently? Right? Not, not how do we have a big you know, meeting or town hall forum, but how do we just take the well-connected people and find ways to get them engaged? And then uh, fourth, uh, we see that the external connectivity of these successful leaders uh, turns out to be you know, far more time spent in the practices that uh, lead these teams into managing the ecosystems. So, you know, obviously we can use the analytics and we have in the consortia to see what's happening and being really precise when people say we need, you know, one firm leadership right, in the organization, uh, what that means. Like, what are these leaders actually doing to promote the collaboration that's generating that versus just throwing kind of tangential things at it? Um, and we can turn them into very specific behaviors, right? You can apply this list of eight to your team, 
and sit down and say, not am I going to go do all these things, but maybe there's two or three that I haven't been thinking about in terms of how we're collaborating. And we know these are huge predictors, right, of, of greater success of the teams or the entities. Uh, seven of the eight, when we've done this across organizations, actually predict market return um, in terms of organizations that start to institutionalize this. And they're very actionable, right? It's just taking a different lens into it and saying not that we need vision, mission, purpose, not that that's not a good thing. But rather, this is a different lens and coming in and saying, okay, I need to make some slight tweaks in terms of, you know, over delayering the center, pulling in the fringe, uh, doing things that, that bridge certain silos. And so the cool thing about this, the, the work that Sloan was awesome in publishing was um, looking at not the positive drivers uh, of performance, but actually what are the patterns that these groups fall into when they underperform, right? And there tend to be six of these derailers that we can see. And it, it evolves around, number one, this hub and spoke, where there's too much of a focus on not just one leader, sometimes it's groups of experts, sometimes it's roles, sometimes it's leaders, uh, but you find that the hub and spoke is really great for short intervals, short spurts, but if you keep it and persist it over time, you start to lose innovation from the spokes, you start to uh, lose engagement, right, and have higher attrition rates around them. Two is where we see disenfranchised, where there's certain clusters in these groups that are well aligned and engaged, but they're marginalizing others in, in very different ways. Sometimes it's some remote work, sometimes it's uh, new capabilities that have been brought in that just haven't you know, fit in. Third is where we see just pure overwhelm and the volume of interactions that the teams uh, have to engage in. Fourth is where we see misalignment, right? And very common in the cross-functional team efforts where people agree in the room and then go off and pull in different directions in ways that traditionally have been invisible. And then the last two, and then I want to get the group to vote uh, for me and, and give me a sense of uh, what, what you all see, right, in your own organizations, what tends to be the things that are most problematic for you. The last two have more to do with um, the, the team or that group's uh, engagement and the ecosystem they're in. And so isolated is one where the team just hasn't kind of sourced or tested ideas enough. Uh, externally, oddly enough, we're seeing this, and it was a big piece we did around agile. We're seeing this a lot of the transitions to agile because we're forming these scrums and the people are moving at really rapid pace, but they're only testing their ideas locally. So they develop something that works in one area, but not uh, in others. Um, and then the last one is the one that we've seen become the biggest is just pure priority overload, and especially as we've seen these layers come out of the hierarchy and the technologies come in. The teams are oftentimes overwhelmed with. Uh, requests from various stakeholders that are themselves disconnected, right? And they're not really aware of the aggregate volume of demands being put on these teams. And the leaders are used to saying, yes, they say, yes, they're overwhelming their teams and it's not a good situation overall. So what I want to end on is just maybe take one moment here and ask um, if we might open a poll and just say, if you think about your organization, um, what's, what's the one that's killing you? What one or two of these are driving you crazy? All right. So why don't we call it then, and I'm, I'm uh, in hopes that people can share the, the poll uh, back out for everybody to be able to see, or you may be able to see my screen. Um, but what you, you, what you see here, right, is a listing from top to bottom, the priority overload uh, is the, the, you know, the clear winner in, in this case. And this has been the intriguing thing to me as we look at our analytics, that's what we're seeing uh, as well. And it, it comes down to um, uh, very, you know, very often lack of analytics and understanding of the demands that are being placed on these teams. What's interesting to me, though, is there are very interesting ways that the teams themselves, the more successful leaders and how we've studied them, um, you find that they learn different defense mechanisms <laughs> against this. So one of my favorite was a very you know, fiery person that she was telling me, I don't take any ask until I plot it on this impact and effort grid, right? And so a leader comes to me and they say, we need to do this thing. And I plot it out on this impact effort grid. And if it's not high impact, low effort, or certainly if it is like, low effort, high, you know, low, low impact, high effort, we're not going to do it. We're going to talk about it. And she said, the funny thing is, like, you do that once or twice with the leaders, and then they stop asking you for crazy stuff, <laughs> right? Because they know this question is going to come. Uh, or other forums where people actually get their stakeholders in the same point in time space, right? Often virtual now. And they'll say, gosh, you know, these stakeholders, you've asked me for these uh, you know, X amount of things, this stakeholder, this amount of things, this stakeholder, this amount of things, put them on post-it notes or flip cards, draw a line as to where your team's capability is, and then put it back to the stakeholders and say, how do we solve this, right? And just creating a clearinghouse. And you often find many, many times that that simple discussion and pushing it back uh, has the effect of engaging those people in conversations that, that start to take the, uh, take the demand off. 
So I am out of time and I want to make sure that we preserve space here for any questions that, that may have come up. But what I wanted to emphasize, you know, as we look at this is teaming is happening very different today. You know, we're, we're very quick to throw conventional models um, that worked, you know, some time ago. What we're seeing more and more is, especially as we try to transition to these agile structures, is that looking at how delivery is occurring through these networks is really, really critical, right? Because you start to see different points of opportunity uh, to improve team effectiveness in a very, very different way. So with that, I will say thank you uh, for the time and, and turn it, uh, Elizabeth, to you, if that's okay. You um, you had mentioned, uh, of course, and, and we just saw in the poll results as well, that uh, the biggest and most rapidly increasing dysfunction is priority overload. Um, and uh, you've also pointed to one of the causes and that it's, uh, you know, people adapting too many collaborative tools or digital architectures without really understanding the collaborative footprint right. of the work. Um, so how can managers gain a better understanding of the footprint and how can they do a better job of adopting tools and not being overly driven by them? Right. Great, great question. Right. So for me, you know, um, I'm using the network analytics and I, and I didn't have much chance to kind of go into the richness of these things, but the ability to see what is the actual collaborative footprint of the ask and and understand that. And what I find is as soon as leaders see that, they're like, holy cow, <laughs> we had no idea what we were doing with this three dimensional matrix. It sounds great. Um, and but but that's been lost. And it's a really, really big deal. I just finished 600 interviews for this book and you get into people's lives very deeply in a way, you know, in that that, that you don't get other senses when it's abstract and I'm just overwhelmed. But it is the nature of the role, like task A can look identical to task B or role A and role B if we're doing org design. But if task A requires coordination with three or four people that are all in the same unit, totally different beast than task B if it requires coordination with five people, two across time zones, two leaders that don't like each other, and one you know, area you've got to convince to cooperate with you, right? Um, th there's weeks of difference just in that small you know, effort there that right now is completely invisible. And it's it's crazy to me because we have all the um, financial metrics to track an expense receipt down to two decimal places, yet we have very little idea of what's happening. And that's the thing that, that you know, I believe will shift. I believe like many evolutions of how work is happening, you see the metrics uh, tail behind a little bit. And I think we're going to get there over five or 10 years, but it's a big, big deal right now. Okay, um, got uh, another question from the audience here. What are some best practices for getting new hires into these networks and creating robust connections virtually versus in person where they may have more opportunistic encounters? Yeah, great question. So one of the things we looked at in these work, and this has been a whole program going on for close to a decade in the, in the consortia, is you could see again, these people that <laughs> were really slingshotting into networks very quickly. And so we interviewed the heck out of them. And, um, and you started with 100 women, 100 men. And, and what you find is that behaviorally it's different today. So on entry, we can see in the first month that there's five kinds of connections that tend to distinguish those people uh, that get connected quickly. There's also a way of engaging that's different, right? And so typically you're told when you come into an organization, go build your brand and do something individually, put points on the board, whatever the, you know, the, the, the term is. And we're finding that's not the right answer, right? People, you know, even if they sit down and ask you, what do you, what are you done? Tell me about yourself. Um, we find the fast movers, the people who get connected quickly, they don't take the bait. They'll actually turn that question back and say, I will in a minute, but tell me about your priorities or your pain points or whatever. And then they're situating their expertise into the established person's needs, right? And, and so they're saying, okay, here's what I do that fits. They're giving status, generating energy, and creating a mutual win. And that's a slightly different nuance from going in and telling your story, right? You're going in and you're co-creating the story, and those people get pulled in at about a third the time that it takes people to kind of push their way in, if you will. So there's a lot of these little nuggets that we see and what companies have been really successful in doing is building that into their you know, workday systems or other things like that, such that at month one, I know that I need these sets of connections and I need to engage in this way. And that spurs a meeting between myself and my leader so that we're thinking about it together. Right. right. We see the same thing just building on the last talk, same exact thing is really promising to me about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And actually thinking about that too in a unique way of, of kind of creating pull where you're not putting the burden on somebody, you're actually altering the, the dynamics of the connections and creating connections in a way that, that, that really brings people in. So 
super excited, as you can tell about yeah. kind of that work and, and where it's going. Right. Now, there's a question uh, from uh, a member of the audience who uh, is obviously, I think, impressed by the uh, power of organizational network analysis that you do, which uh, always makes people quite question, how can we do that? Um, but in particular, the question is, what are best practices on collecting this type of data, measuring and analyzing in an organization um, without relying on surveillance? Right. Sort of so that's, 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 that's our again, surveillance culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's another hour discussion right there. <laughs> but, right. So two, two thoughts. One is I would definitely point people to my website at robcross.org. There's a ton of free resources out there that we make available to everybody through the consortia, and there'll be some materials that go into that. Um, I think at the heart of it, people always talk about, you know, do we do survey-based approaches or do we do passive analytics? And at the heart of it, they each have really good strengths. And I've been on three you know, discussions today with people that are using the passive analytics on email or calendaring data or things like that to develop algorithms of overload and to start to see where are people getting in trouble because of these invisible pressures coming on them um, or to see are we, are we engaging people in the way we want, like in these new hires, you know, have we brought them in in a way that, that they're getting kind of connected in a way that's going to decrease the odds of attrition? So there's tremendous strengths to that um, in those analytics. There's also huge strengths in the survey based approach and very, very rapid tools that have been built on that as well to get to understand the quality of the connection. Right? So the, the volume of revenue produced are things uh, that um, that's also worth right? that, that it kind of depends on the use at the heart of it as to which uh, which approach is better. Right. Okay. And let's see if we can uh, make this a quick one. We've got about one minute left, um, but it's a good question because I, I, I had it too. As uh, you know, we saw that the uh, overwhelmed and priority overload or sort of two, two and one, how do you distinguish between those patterns? The priority overload um, is for me is coming externally, right? It's where you have too many disconnected stakeholders that are driving demands in. And this again, as we've gone to these digital ways of working agile, you know, delayered structures, it, one of the problems with that is that, right? And it's not to say we don't want to do it. I really want to emphasize this because the work is really critical, right, to form these teams, but it's that we need different clearing houses for how the work kind of moves in an organization. And we need these different understandings of the footprint. The, the uh, overwhelmed is more internally driven, right? And it's driven by leaders a lot of times that they mistakenly think it's, you know, we didn't over, over inclusion, right? Uh, we need a Zoom meeting for everything. And, you know, we're going to involve everybody, right? They're not thinking about what's the pattern of connectivity I need here to be successful. And so that's, that's typically more the driver there. Right. Okay. Well, and that is all we have time for. So thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, always uh, great to hear from you. And uh, we're, we're privileged to have published a lot of your work. So yeah. I encourage my, my audience purpose. members <laughs> who find it interesting to uh, go uh, and look for Rob Cross's uh, uh, work on, on our website as well. Uh, so thanks so much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. Well, that is our last session for today. Um, we're very grateful to all of today's speakers for their insights into how managers can shape more open, equitable, and effective workplaces. So many great ideas, and I'm really glad we're recording because I, I took some notes, but I wasn't able to really capture it all. And, and I really especially like this sense of kind of optimism and possibility about what the future of work can look like. Uh, as long as we all engage in doing that work. Absolutely. Um, and I'm very excited about tomorrow. I hope you'll all come back to hear from another great slate of speakers. Uh, we're going to be delving into the very timely question of how to create good jobs and career pathways that keep employees engaged and on board and how to lead those efforts effectively in remote or hybrid workplaces. Thank you to WebEx by Cisco for making this event possible and we hope to see you all back here tomorrow. Mm -hmm.